um, Australia and New Zealand could integrate small South Pacific economies into our own economies and allow freedom of travel for work uh, and open our labour markets to the South Pacific island populations. We have labour shortages. They want... Well, that's a fascinating question. You've obviously been watching Australian politics. I think it's a little bit schizophrenic. In this episode, we discover Australia's security challenges, Talisman Sabre Exercise 2023, or Castile, China's influence. Japan Ground Self-Defence Forces Groundbreaking Type 12 Missile Demo of Australian Coast. Orca Steel's financial and infrastructure issues, how to proceed and collaborate with both partners. We analyse Orca's problems, financing, infrastructure, localisation, collaboration between government and business. Australia's stance against Premier Sogova's corruption amid China's influence in the Pacific. Beijing's trade weapon, harsh sanctions and their implications for PM's meeting with the chairman. Hi everyone, today we have a guest from Australia, it's Michael Shoebridge. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Richard. Thank you very much. Let's start with a short introduction. Good. So, well, I'm Michael Shoebridge. I'm the director and founder of a new Australian defence and security think tank, Strategic Analysis Australia. I come to it after four and a half years at uh, the premier Australian government think tank, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, and before that, I spent over 25 years in various jobs and roles in Australia's national security community. So I was the deputy in two intelligence agencies, uh, the head of the strategic policy division in the defence organisation, and I ran a division, the defence and intelligence division, in our prime minister's department. So now I'm out of the secret world and I'm in the think tank world. Perfect. Sounds great. Um, I would like to start with a recent exercise, the Talisman Sabre which uh, is still ongoing, I guess. It's from the July 22nd to August 4th. And uh, maybe some comments with regard to this exercise and one issue in particular. I know that's an Australian military first, that the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force, they have conducted a live fire demonstration of a type of 12 surface to ship missile off the Australian East Coast. So maybe that would be something especially interesting. Yes, good point. Well, Talisman Sabre is, a, is the major high-end military exercise run between the Australian military and the US military. But it's not just a bilateral exercise now. This year, there were 13 participating nations with their militaries and around 30,000 military personnel from the total of the 13 nations' defence forces. Uh, it's been conducted over a very wide area of land, sea and air, going right round from the northwest coast of Australia, 6,000 kilometres around to Norfolk Island on the east coast of Australia, because Australia is a continent as well as a country. And it's involved amphibious operations, coordinated uh, air and land operations and maritime, maritime and air uh, exercises as well. We've had a tragic accident where four Australian military personnel lost their lives in a helicopter crash doing night flying, um, which is a tragedy. But realistic military exercises involve risk. And last year, a Patriot missile was fired and that now famous HIMARS uh, rocket system. This year, in another first, as you say, the Japanese Self-Defence Force have done a firing of a very effective anti-ship missile uh, launched by the Ground Self-Defence Force from a test range on Australia's east coast. And it really tells you this exercise is not just about practising, it's about deterrence of China, deterrence of conflict in our region by showing very capable individual militaries able to work really closely together. How is the attitude of your government? Does it really say it's straightforward, 
China is the enemy or is it still on, on, on the fence? How does it look like, let's say, from the political or diplomatic point of view? Well, that's a fascinating question. You've obviously been watching Australian politics. Um, it's not new that the Australian uh, relationship with China has an enormous economic side to it. Uh, we are the major supplier of iron ore and a major supplier of coal and other natural resources to the Chinese economy. That powers the Chinese economy and a lot of their production. But at the same time, we have a collision of strategic interests between Australia and China, just as most of the developed world is now discovering with their own China challenge. So our government, the new government, has been very keen on re-establishing a political relationship that is minister-to-minister -minister meetings and removing some of the coercive economic measures that Beijing put in place against Australian trade on things like lobsters, wine, barley and coal. And the problem with that is they haven't wanted to say anything which, which might upset Beijing, while at the same time we're having this collision of strategic interests. So we've hosted this massive multinational high-end military exercise designed to deter China from using its force to achieve its interests. And on the political and economic side, the government seems very keen to get any lost markets back and double down on the economic and political relationship with Beijing. I think it's a little bit schizophrenic. Yeah, and I think the Chinese also sent a representative, let's say there was a ship spying on the exercise, right? Was there any trouble or was it just tolerated and that's it? I mean, that's the new normal, right? Well, yes. I mean, the last year, the last time this exercise was run two years ago, they sent one intelligence collection ship, like an electronic vacuum cleaner, you know, vacuuming up all the electronic emissions, whether it's from missiles or radars or communication. This time, they sent two intelligence collection ships. Mind you, because the exercise covered 6,000 kilometres of coastline and all the air and sea space around there, two ships can't really do the job terribly well. Um, however, I think it shows China is wanting to use these opportunities to gather intelligence for its own military. That's not new news. But it's also a signal that they understand this is about deterring them. So that's good news. Yeah, we in Taiwan, we were more lucky recently because we had this Han Kuang exercise and due to weather conditions, they couldn't really listen. And as you said, vacuum all the, all the noise here from Taiwan. So actually ours were more secretive this time because, because they couldn't really circle around Taiwan. I wanted to ask another question. Let's stay with the military about the AUKUS deal. And there is, from what I know, some financial and infrastructure problems with regard to this project. I found a very interesting article on your page you were reviewing Arthur Herman's Freedom Forge. And then the two things that stood out to me was, first, you were discussing preparing for the bad times ahead of them, which uh, you discussed during the Second World War, actually before. And the second thing was making the government collaborate with business. Hmm. How do you think, how could we make this happen today? Because there is a lot of trouble with, you know, kicking off the, the AUKUS deal. Dear viewers, Help us overcome algorithm suppression by liking, commenting, and sharing this important content. Especially since we talk to world's top experts. Well, yes, Richard, I mean, it's hard to know which bit of the AUKUS deal to particularly focus on, but I suppose I've had a focus on the nuclear submarine part of it. People think a lot about uh, the arrangements for the production of the nuclear submarines, uh, between Australia, the UK and the United States and about the United States uh, selling Australia some of their own Virginia class before the new AUKUS design is produced. But the other big part of this is basing an infrastructure. Uh, the AUKUS deal is meant to bring American and UK nuclear submarines to Australia to be deployed from Australia rather than have to travel back home to the US or to the UK. So it's meant to increase the availability of nuclear submarines from the three AUKUS partners 
before Australia gets any of them. But to do that, we've got to get the basing done with a much greater sense of urgency than, the, than we have at the moment. We have to modify and expand the existing Australian submarine base in Western Australia near Perth to take uh, extra submarines, US and UK submarines, and we have to build a whole new submarine base on the East Coast. Well, none of this will just be done by government plans. It's got to be with the companies that are going to build and operate these facilities right in the middle of the planning conversation very early on. And that's not really happening. Uh, so that will that could affect the momentum of the AUKUS program if it isn't addressed quickly, because Australia is putting a lot of pressure on the Americans to get their production right, to uh, reinvest in their uh, production base, and to remove a whole lot of technical and regula regulatory restrictions to let us get hold of these nuclear submarines. We have to show we're doing everything we need to and more and not uh, be pushing the Americans to move fast and moving slowly ourselves. Yeah, I, I, I saw one of your tweets. It was really interesting. It, it looked, as if I understand it correctly, like you, you meant that the administrative part would be more difficult and time-consuming than actually the building itself. So the preparation and dealing with the government and paperwork might be actually the most difficult part. Is this correct? <laughs> Well, yes, and not just even the government. I think there's a little bit of an analogy with uh, the American presence in Okinawa in Japan, and I think a lot of your listeners would know a lot about that, uh, that it's it's the local uh, council and uh, uh, provincial authorities as well as local residents and all of the people that currently use the place. So, you know, a likely site for Australia is is a port called Port Kembla, an old steel-making town south of Sydney. Well, there are a lot of businesses with their own plans to for how to use that port, and there are residents who will have concerns about nuclear submarines turning up uh, near, near their house. It's all that front-end um, consultation and decision-making and winding your way through the three levels of government we have in Australia, the local, the state, and the federal. That takes a whole lot of time before you start digging the first foundation to put the wharf in. Yeah, that seems probably easier in China. Yeah, but that's the disadvantage of living in a democracy. I wanted to ask you about the Pacific Islands because um, I was talking to Cleo Pascal and she mentioned that Australia could do at least one thing. If they, let's say they don't want to commit too politically or maybe, you know, don't commit any any... Uh, police, or military forces, or any equipment, what they could do, at least they could expose Premier Sogavaris' corruption and really track the money so that may, to make it more difficult for them, you know, to, to hide the wealth in Australia, what they do. Is there any, any, anything that the Australian government is ready or eager to do with regard to the Pacific Islands where China is expanding its influence? Well, I think that's an interesting idea from Cleo Pascal, and she's always insightful. Um, I think transparency about who's paying for influence does matter in a democracy, and a lot of policymakers tend to overlook the fact that the Pacific Islands are democracies. We're not just dealing with political elites and whoever happens to be the prime minister. It's the population that determines the direction of the country. And in the case of Mr. Sogavare, I think he's going to drive a wedge between the Solomon's people and himself by his clear desire to hang on to and increase his personal power rather than behave like the prime minister who's been elected in a democracy and who needs to keep the democracy strong. So exposing if he's received corrupting payments, that would be a part of it. But he's already been exposed for receiving a large amount of money to buy votes of members of parliament in the Solomon's parliament to keep his job as prime minister. So in a way, that's not new news. I think there's an even bigger idea about dealing with Chinese influence, not just in the Solomons, but in all of the South Pacific. And it kind of fits with the Taiwanese approach to uh, a relationship is as much an economic and political relationship as it is a security relationship. Um, Australia and New Zealand could integrate small South Pacific economies into our own economies and allow 
freedom of travel for work uh, and open our labour markets to the South Pacific island populations. We have labour shortages. They want work. Um, and if, if we do that and we harmonise our economies using the same framework that Australia and New Zealand have had in place for about 50 years now, it keeps their sovereignty, but it delivers prosperity. And at the moment, our policies are about giving them patrol boats, training their police, and giving them aid that hasn't led to economic development. This does a whole different thing, and it's also an offer that Beijing cannot make, economic integration with free travel between our populations. So that's a much bigger and better idea, I think, than trying to expose corruption of individual yeah. figures. That's fantastic. And it would, it would definitely pull those countries away from China, like that they can't be this offer. And it would be very good for Australia and New Zealand. It's the kind of economic policy that we need. So is there any chance to make this happen or is this just an idea? Well, when I talk with policymakers in Canberra, they say it makes sense. Uh, it really has to get a bit more political traction, though. And I think as we see Mr. Sogavare keep building his personal and security relationship with Beijing, it will open our political eyes to the need to change track on our policy. If you believe in me, please like it, leave a comment and share the show with friends. It might not look like it, but I have quite a lot of expenses. I am not asking for money, only for support. The goal of this program is to spread the knowledge. Thank you. That sounds great. Um, the last question I wanted to ask you is uh, Beijing using uh, trade as a weapon. And I know that I think your prime minister, as you just mentioned, so eager to, to keep the relationship going. Um, he has a problem to meet the chairman because, because of the, the sanctions. And uh, the last time they met was uh, during the G20 in November. So is there, is there a chance they would meet this year? And would, would, your, um, would your prime minister visit the chairman? Is there a chance? Well, I think the government and from the prime minister down, but particularly the prime minister and the foreign minister really want a meeting with uh, President Xi. And that is because they see it as of a big domestic advantage to contrast their management of the China relationship with the previous coalition government led by Scott Morrison. Um, whether they think it will actually do anything good uh, in Australia's national interests in dealing with the China challenge, I think is secondary to them wanting to say to the Australian public that they're managing the relationship more professionally than the previous government. But I think there's a growing realisation um, in the Prime Minister's mind that if he turns up in Beijing and smiles and shakes Xi's hand and Xi has given no concessions, um, has not removed any of the coercive trade measures that remain on uh, lobsters, wine, barley, coal and wood, and hasn't released Australian citizens who are unlawfully detained on very odd grounds, uh, Cheng Lei and Yang Henjun. Well, he, he, there's nothing in it for our Prime Minister. It just looks like he's a supplicant to Beijing and we're getting nothing um, out of this new approach. So I think there are prospects that the visit... Uh, will be delayed. It's, it, I think the ideal timing is October, November. But really, Beijing looks to me like it's thinking, why would I give the Australian government anything? They seem to want to keep making concessions in the hope that I will do things. Why not keep doing that? Good. Um, the last thing, um, is there anything uh, you would like to add? Maybe you're researching now or you're working on something that is of interest to you, something you would like to point out, some additional idea or maybe, you know, something that's going on and interests you? Well, I think um, one big thing that's, that's a continuing research interest for me and for Strategic Analysis Australia is the impact of the Ukraine war 
on our region's security and also the impact that the Ukraine war should be having on some of our our own defence and security choices around technologies and capabilities. So on the first one, on the impact of the Ukraine war on our own security, um, I think there's one very powerful positive effect, which is it turns out that Western military technology, military technology and things, civil technology like Starlink terminals, they are having a dominant decisive effect on the battlefield in the hands of the Ukrainian military. So anyone that thinks they want to engage in a war where they might face Western military technology needs to think again because it's proven far more effective than a lot of people would have expected. And that's true for the decision makers in Beijing and the decision makers in Moscow. Uh, that's, That's one big topic of continued interest. The other one is how can we look at how some of the Ukrainian people, industry and military are working and use that to our benefit to make ourselves more powerful militarily and a stronger deterrent? One big thing is working together. So Australia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, America, all working together with a sense of collective defence, which is so powerful with the way NATO is supporting Ukraine, but also embracing some of the civilian technologies and getting them in the hands of our militaries much faster. The Ukrainians have done that brilliantly, and I don't think it's happening fast enough in Australia's military or in Taiwan's military, um, and Japan's military is starting to, to get much faster. So those two topics, lessons out of Ukraine for, for our own region's security and the power of deterrence and collective defence, and getting hold of some of the technologies and approaches we see the Ukrainians using so well to make ourselves more powerful and make conflict less likely. Great. Very valid. And the last thing I'd say, Richard, is watching who succeeds the fabulously impressive President Tsai Ing-wen, because I think she really has repositioned Taiwan, uh, not just as an economic and digital powerhouse, but also as a much more influential political voice. And I think that's that's been a very good outcome of her term. Uh, I, With all politics, it's hard to predict who the new person will be but I hope there's some consistency with the Taiwanese approach from uh, from the current one. I totally agree. I actually think she's achieved everything that Xi Jinping wanted. She has global recognition. She handled COVID quite well. The economy did well. And, you know, she, she really elevated Taiwan's status globally. So everything that he actually had, you know, wanted to achieve, she actually has done. So, yes, I, t- I, I agree very much with you. And that's and also I have to say that the outcome is still kind of uncertain. So we, we have to see what happens. But it's also not only us watching, definitely people in, in Beijing as well. Mm. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you very much for your remarks and for your time. Thank you very much. Good. Thanks, Richard. Lovely to talk with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. Very good to talk with you on excellent topics. I think it shows you've got your own research agenda too, which is very good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Have Great. a nice day. Thanks, Bye. Richard. You too.